you know, if you're too warm, you can get sleepy. Some people heat up when they start meditating. Some people don't. Some people cool off. So it's nice to set yourself up and make sure you're in a nice position that you can hold in a comfortable, relaxed way for, we'll do about a half hour sit. And when you're ready, go ahead and close your eyes and start to deepen your breath. Feel this kind of limbic response as you open and enter into this more liminal space of meditation. Such a natural place for us to, to return to nourishment for the soul. And notice if you're holding any tension in the neck or the jaw, the face, just you can even turn the head a little bit side to side, breathing into any tension and releasing with the out breath. And feel any tension in the shoulders, the arms, the chest. Releasing with each out breath. It's just feeling of like a, a melting of tension from the top of the body down through the, through the entire body, the torso. With each out breath releasing more deeply, the belly, the low back, the sacrum, the hips. Relaxing the legs feet, and then feel that breath in the full body as much as possible, feel the sensations of the breath as it flows in and out of the body, and feel the mind with all of its swirling and activity settling into the body. You could even anchor it into the belly for a while. Feel the sensations of the breath in the belly against the clothing, expanding and releasing. may notice a more subtle layer of relaxation through the jaw on the face. Feel the chin slightly drawing in towards the center of the throat, lengthening the back of the neck. Relaxing the shoulders down the back. And bring the tip of the tongue to rest against the upper palate. The eyes can be open or closed as you like. Hands in your lap or palms down on your thighs. The spine nice and tall, or lengthened if you're on your back. Feel that S curve supporting the weight of the body aligned with gravity without too much effort. Let's start the practice with some gratitude for this body. It takes a beating through the day and night and might not always treat it so well. And just give thanks, even though it might be a little rickety or a little problematic at times. It's still your body, so give thanks to the things that do work. Beating heart, the lungs, the legs, the arms, the eyes that see, the ears that hear. It's with each breath, breathe in some love and appreciation, a feeling of gratitude for the aspects and even the challenge, the positive aspects, but even those challenging ones, 
As Lojong practitioners, we take all life onto the path. Even the pains, the illness, these are all our teachers. Even starting to open a little more to gratitude for every part. Gratitude for the breath and our speech, capacity to communicate, breathe knowingly and also passively. It's always happening. Thank you. deeper layer of the speech aspect of body, speech, and mind is also the subtle body, the prana, the winds, the motility or circulatory factor within the body. Thank you. Thank you. You could even say out loud, thank you. These different parts of your body, your breath, and now the mind as well, thoughts, preferences, fantasies, longings, joy, sorrow, everything in between. Thank you. Consciousness, awareness. Thank you. Thank you. The intellect, discernment, clarity, luminosity, and also the confusion, the grasping. It's all a part of the rainbow of who we are. Thank you, thank you. Meister Eckhart said if the only prayer you say is thank you, that will be enough. What would it feel like if we greeted or encountered, if we met most or all or even just some aspects of our life with gratitude like that? Thank you. Someone criticizes you. Thank you. Someone praises you. Thank you. All the eight mundane concerns of hope and fear I see you, thank you, my teachers. We take those challenges to help us become stronger and more clear about who we are and our boundaries and our, our goals, our ideals, our fortitude, our ethics.
of that sense of gratitude and care. We bring mindfulness to the breath and the body, not taking it for granted, but actually becoming interested in it. With some tenderness, with some softness, we turn to it and and almost like link our mind to it. It's like, you know, when you connect a carabiner to another, it's like, let's all link, link our attention a bit more conscientiously to the breath in the body so that we can stay grounded like we're rooting a helium balloon, tying it down a bit so that it can actually experience the fruit and the pleasure of mindfulness of the breath. The mind is so tricky. It tricks us into thinking that it's more interesting than this. But let's let's tell it to take a back seat for now. The distracted mind can kind of go into the distance and see if you can maintain even one through ten, like a counting of the breath. I'll be quiet in a moment. We'll do maybe three to five rounds, depending on your breath, of one to ten. Just a gentle linking of the breath, not a firm or a tight one. Just a gentle, easeful, unifying of the mind, mindfulness with the breath and the body. Sensations of the breath as it travels in and out of the body, the field of sensations from the nose to the throat, the lungs, the belly, and back out. Just an internal counting at the top of each breath, one through 10, and start again, releasing distraction as it arises. We'll practice in silence.
body, go ahead and release the counting and just breathe with presence, feeling that quality of resting in awareness rather than fused and pulled into thought. See if you can maintain that quality. You'll get lost and you'll come back, and that's good. wish you can open the eyes for more of settling the mind in its natural state, shifting into the domain of the mind as the anchor rather than the breath, or you can stay with the breath if you prefer. Settling the mind in its natural state, we allow thoughts to arise and pass without rejection or acceptance. We just observe. You can even look for the source, location, and destination for thought and realizing that there's no actual thing called a thought. Experience and taste the empty nature of thought, which brings us to our rigpa, our innate wisdom, awareness, the space within which all thoughts come and go. Let each breath be an unraveling, a releasing of the clinging, the grasping, the tightness, even down to the brainstem, even down the spinal column to the root of the spine, all that subtle and gross form of grasping that keeps us bound. Let the meditation be an unwinding, 
an unwinding of not just the mind, but also the ways that the mind holds the body in compression and tightness. It's all connected. And that will open the breath if you feel the brainstem, the base of the skull area opening, it will open the breath. And the breath will open the abdomen, the abdomen will open the back, the back will open the sacrum, the circulation will flow more naturally. As I mentioned last week, the distracting mind is so tricky and it has all these strategies for help for making sure that we avoid the, the abyss, right? It will even convince us that we need it to not feel lonely, to not feel the abyss. And maybe that was true for a while in our youth certain times in our life, but in the safety of the meditative space where we probe deeply, we aspire to get to the root and pull up the root of our suffering, we have a bit more courage and fortitude to dip the big toe in to the abyss and tell the mind, you're not going to die. You can come with me. And when you step into that, and that abyss is actually your center. It's not out there. It's the central channel. It's the core. It's your essence of mind. What you realize is, is it's that which you've been looking for all along. It's home. It's returning home to the lap or the arms of the Great Mother. The ground of your being, your Buddha nature, however you want to call it, same thing. And then that death of the small self becomes uh, joyful logs on the fire of awareness. Thoughts become logs that help the fire of awareness burn brighter. They become fuel for the fire of your own wisdom. Sometimes we go there slowly, sometimes we jump in. Trust yourself. Develop that trust. That's your task. It's not mine, it's not your other teachers, it's your task. Find your way in. Chogyam Trungpa said that we're so avoidant of the this abyss, this falling. But once we finally do it, whether it's voluntarily or by mistake, <laughs> we realize there's no ground to fall upon. And then we can fly, float, like the Dakinis and the Dakas, the wisdom beings. Traverse in space, that is our essential nature, that is the mind. And we rest and we know the groundless ground. And 
we're not afraid of that anymore. And the training is to stay, stay, stay. If you wish, bringing your awareness back to this quality of gratitude for the time, for the practice, for our Sangha, for these teachings, for the Buddha, and all of those great teachers who have paved the way for us. Gratitude to our mentors, to our friends, our family, but also to the earth, the elements, beings on the earth. seen and unseen beings, our ancestors, even giving gratitude if you can to your enemies, those who challenge you, maybe not an enemy, but a challenging person or people, life as path, thank you, thank you. All of these aspects craft who we are. And take your hand or hands on your heart and take a moment to again give gratitude to yourself. You're here. You're doing your work. Let that really seep in. Seep seep into your bones and your cells that you are an amazing human being. No one like you. 
unique and gifted in your various ways. Imperfect, just as it should be. Take your seat in that. Yes, this is, this is my life. Thank you. And let's dedicate the merit, any good energy of our practice for the benefit of all beings everywhere, like a drop of water releasing into the vast ocean of positive energy. We release it, it becomes vast. Benefiting many. We offer it up. Thank you. We can only see half of you. Uh oh, did I lose you? No, there you are. Um, that's okay. Sometimes we don't want to be seen. But I can, I know you're here. <laughs> it's, yeah, if you, if you can, just say hi for a minute. It's nice to, for me to be able to put names to faces. Thanks. Hi. <laughs> Still in quarantine. <laughs> oh my God. Still here in samsara. Doing our best. You know, the, the, the goddess Tara, the Bu female Buddha Tara, she's often depicted with one leg. She's in this posture. She's not in full lotus like most Buddhas are represented. She's in what's called, it's got two names, the horse dismounting posture or the posture of royal ease. I like both of them. And so one leg, her right leg is a bit forward. Sometimes it's shown her foot is stepping onto a lotus flower. And that right leg symbolizes her stepping out into the world, into samsara, to be of benefit, to be of help to beings. She's accessible. If we pray to her, it said she'll come. All sorts of stories, even recently, some people have emailed me Tara stories. They're still happening. I have Tara stories. <laughs> you probably have Tara stories. Tara's, she's one of those energies that are actually more in the, like, palpable, right? So that's the right leg is coming. And then the left leg is tucked in nice and tight, like a, near her perineum. Um, heel near the perineum, like in half lotus, sort of. And that symbolizes her fully rooted in and centered in nirvana. So she's stable, she's in her central channel, she's, she knows who she is, right? She's taken her seat, she's in samadhi of nirvana. And yet the right leg is stepping into samsara to be of benefit. I just love that, I love that. Her, her left hand is in the mudra of the three jewels which symbolizes the Buddha Dharma Sangha, right? It's also called the protection mudra. Yeah, you can take it. The thumb and the ring fingers are touching tips. Yeah, left hand. Left hand, yeah. And it's right near the left, your heart, kind of near the left breast. Like that. And these two fingers are holding uh, the stem of a blue lotus flower that rises up and is blooming at her shoulder and that is interesting because you know even in Egypt and India throughout various parts of the world there the blue lotus is a medicinal plant also um, kind of a mild hallucinogen also considered an aphrodisiac you can actually buy blue lotus tea <laughs> and tincture I have tincture it's very mild it's nice 
You should try it. <laughs> you just go online. And, um, you know, these symbols are so interesting. And so that's, that's her left hand. And sometimes the, the lotus flower will have different symbols on it that mean things. Sometimes it's just a blooming lotus. And then the, her right hand is on her right knee, palm open. Her arm is kind of straight and down and the palm is open. And that's the mudra of um, supreme generosity, dana, giving. A meaning that she's giving protection, she's giving compassion, she's giving love, unending. Sometimes there are dharma chakras, dharma wheels on her. Hey, that'd be a cool tattoo. Thinking about tattoo. <laughs> my daughter, my child, wants to get a tattoo. And you got to think about these things. What's meaningful? Well, Tara got tattoos on her palms and her soles of her feet. Dharma chakras, dharma wheels. I've never seen tattoos on palms. That sounds pretty painful. In any case, so that's the generosity mudra. Supreme generosity is her right hand, and then the protection or the three jewel protection mantra is her left hand. So in tantric Buddhism, like we embody those. We actually take the position, or we visualize the position, or we visualize the deity in front, or we become the deity, and we transform the mind through creative visualization. It's just another form of shamatha, really a little more flavor. So I have no idea why I got on that whole thing with Tara, but it's the whole leg thing of stepping forward into samsara, but also being rooted in nirvana. I think there's something about that that wanted to come through. And I want you to think about that in your life, you know. It's like, can I be in the world, but also rooted in my, in my core? One of our teachers Jennifer Wellwood both Eve and I studied with I, I'm not studying with her anymore I studied with her for many years Eve's still with her but um, she would teach this 60-40 thing I think I brought this into how many people have learned the 60-40 60-40 yeah it's pretty cool where you practice whenever you're talking to somebody or meditate you know whether it's in like a dyad work like exercise with a partner or just at work or talking to your partner or your kid practice 60 percent like the left leg rooted in nirvana and your central axis like rooted in yourself and your knowing and then 40 percent of your attention available to the other right so you're present you're you're with them but you're not coming off up and out of yourself to connect that's so interesting often we come up and out of ourselves to connect right we, I don't know who had that idea, <laughs> so, but we do it. Oh, how are you? Oh, you know, maybe that's my version of it, but we tend, we can do that. Maybe you don't. So this, if, but if you are someone who feels that you lose yourself in relationship or you, you get decentered and you've got to find your way back, think of Tara. Right leg forward, engage, but the left leg is rooted and in. You know, you can hold both of those simultaneous truths within you at any time. Or think of the 60 40. 60% 60 in my central channel, in my spine, I'm rooted. I know what, how I feel. I'm tracking my breath. I'm tracking my belly. And then 40% available. So nice. Like even as you're listening to me, you can practice that. For the rest of the class, practice that. And I'll practice it too. I'm practicing it right now. Feel my belly. Feel my feet on the floor. And yet I'm seeing you. I'm watching your facial expressions. It helps me gauge the relationship. Very interesting. It's a mindfulness practice. <laughs> Let's just take three breaths doing that. No talking. Let's just 40% looking at each other, eyes open. You can look at one person, you can look at the whole grid. 
60% in your belly, in your center. It's a different way of being together, isn't it? It's, for me, deeply satisfying. Yeah. Even on Zoom. <laughs> How's it feel for you? Maybe you chat in something if you want, or unmute. Why not? Get daring. Unmute yourself. Hi, Chandra. Hi, Karen. Uh, I just want to say thank you. I was actually going to ask you how to uh, sort of be in this like vast, spacious awareness when talking to other people or yeah. I'm about to travel to Texas in the middle of their pandemic to visit friends. And, you know, it's uh, a lot of anxiety and I'm really trying to stay rooted in myself and yeah. uh, contact that, but be sociable, Yeah, pleasant to be around. Um, and so, yeah, thank you. I think that was helpful. There you go. You got it. Remember Green Tara, I think. Yeah, and then Pretty Green Tara, just let her green light surround you like a healing bubble so you don't get any of those <laughs> COVID bugs. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Well, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Safe travels. It's scary to think of traveling right now. I, I can, I feel you. I wouldn't, I'd feel a little nervous. Yeah. Anyone else? Karen, get some Listerine and take a little travel size and gargle with it at the airport, even at, on the plane. And when you get off the plane, I did that when I had to go somewhere. And um, also nasal sprays, keep your nasal passages clean with like xylitol. They've just got some nice nasal xylitol style nasal spray or grapefruit seed extract nasal spray you can get health food stores so keep your passages clear yeah i think they did a study and they found that listerine kills i don't know a big percentage of covid bugs dr chandra just line up Okay, so you want to do the slogan? Okay, let's do the slogan. Sometimes I feel like the slogans are just a framework for me to talk about whatever I want to talk about. <laughs> Sometimes they demand more dil more discipline. Oh, somebody's chatting, Joe. Oh, yeah, this is good. Okay, good. For some reason, I feel bad about the 60 N-word attention and 40 related attention balance. I tend to be in my head a lot. So immersing into present relational experience is grounding, but I do lose myself. So I'm curious about that guilt from about 60%. Yeah, you're not, I think a lot of us feel that way. That's why it's so revolutionary. So um, I think it comes through practice. What you find is that when you start doing it, other people are given the permission to do it too more, even if it's not uh, spoken they feel it around you and they want to like people like being around that you know there's a feeling of oh he's grounded you know he's grounded okay so I can ground right like we can train with each other and what I like about 60 40 is it's just 10 percent <laughs> you know I mean it's a 20 20 percent differential but you know just 10 percent more with yourself so it's actually not that palpable like you're not being aloof and cold you're just not losing yourself in the other. It's actually a beautiful gift, Joe. Yeah, the guilt is coming from some kind of 
assumption that we have that it's a keeping myself from others, but actually it's a giving. Because you're giving the gift of your presence in a deeper way. And you're showing, you're kind of through action, through body, you're, you're modeling how others could do that too. It's actually a relief. So sometimes, you know, with what I love about Dharma is we actually use the mind to break through ignorance or assumptions, right? So, you know, investigate that in your meditation. Like, where is that guilt for me? You know, I gave some hints, but you probably have some nuance that could be interesting and you could journal about it. How does that feel? Anything else come up around that? Spot on and very helpful. And um, I think another underlying thing is a um, just a lack of confidence in the um, my own intentional stability and like the kind of expectation of someone else to meet me in relationship to do that like co-regulating work but <laughs> so I, I liked what you said that like it's an invitation for others to meet. yeah that's, that's useful it can be as simple, like I'm getting this image, right? I'm just intuitively getting it. It can be as simple as like when you go out to coffee with a friend and you're both standing in line and about to make your order. Like 60-40 could be like, I take a breath into my feet. I feel my belly. You know, do you want to go first? Should I go first? You know, like not rushing. It helps us not rush. It helps us avoid saying things that we regret or you know stumbling into situations that it's a it's a nice way and it's true that with with our teacher we would actually sit face to face we do the retreats where or day longs or something where we would sit face to face and she'd give us some instruction on how to actually you gaze you have some repeating phrases and you're practicing the 60 40 and you take turns so we did have more structure on how to train up in that. But I also think it's something that's, you know, doable out and about on your own, even though we don't have that kind of environment here. That's why I gave you a taste of it a little bit a moment ago, just to try it together. So remember that taste, you know, in a way that was like pointing out instruction. Like you got a taste. That's what teachers do. They give you pointing out instructions where they give you a taste. It's not rational usually. And then you know that flavor. You can find that again. Trust yourself with that. And then in your meditation practice, breathe into your belly. Practice enlivening your, your core, right? Your, sometimes we do belly, heart, and head centers. You can enliven those three centers. Or you can feel the central channel or your spine nice like a tree, nice and firm. You know, do, do practices where you really train up in that feeling. Yeah. Great. Okay. So we're on number 47. And I kind of already set us up for it because I have been talking and we talk a lot. Eve talks a lot about the body, speech, and mind. You're probably like tired of the body, speech, and mind. <laughs> but maybe you're not. In any case, the, the 47th uh, slogan, I will paste it, is keep the three inseparable. It's kind of cryptic. Thanks, Claudia. I saw your, your chat there. I don't know if there were other chats I had. No, okay, good. All right, keep the three inseparable. Um, the Tibetan is Drelme Sum Dung Denpar Ja. And Drelme Sum. So Drelme Sum is three, keep the three in separate, is the three, inseparable three. Drelme is inseparable, Sum is the number three, Dung is and, Dung Denpar means to like having or to keep it together. Ja is to do it. So Drelme Sum Dung Denpar Ja means keep the three inseparable. And what they're talking about are the body, speech, and mind. So we're doing it. So lo jong literally means mind training. So it can be deceptive. Uh, and we can think it's just about the mind. But it's actually not. It's, it's also about integrating 
you know, our speech and our actions, body, speech, and mind. And so um, the idea with Lojong, with this slogan, with meditation, is that we become so thoroughly and completely permeated with Lojong, with mind training, like we dream it, we eat it, we drink it, we breathe it. We become so permeated with Lojong that there is no separation whatsoever between our speech, our actions, and our thoughts. You know, the thoughts are what are behind everything, right? Like even the Buddha said in the in the Dhammapada, is this, the the mind is like the horse guiding the cart. Paraphrase. That the mind is chief. And it le- takes the lead. That's why we work with the mind. That's why Buddhists will say, yeah, out of the three of body, speech, and mind, actually training the mind is of utmost importance because it's the mind that influences everything else, and it's the mind that gets liberated. It's also the mind that goes from body to body. You know, So if we, we just focus on our physique, we can't take it with us to the next life, so it's kind of a waste of energy. Now, it's important to be it's important to be healthy, it's important to exercise, to eat well. And some Buddhists don't take that seriously and, you know, have problems because of that. So I'm a big advocate for the importance of taking good care of our body because, as my mentor used to say, without your health, you don't have anything, right? So we need to be healthy as best as we can. So we train in the body, speech, and mind. And... In terms of the body, the idea is not to force your body to do long meditation sits or pretzel positions of yoga or things that are completely outrageous. It's not about perfection in the physical domain. Um, Instead, no matter what the condition of your body is in, whether it's healthy or young or aged or, uh, you know, going through challenges, wherever you are, whoever you are, Um, no matter what the condition of your body is, you can still manifest your physical presence. The qualities of gentleness, mindfulness, openness, that those are, you're communicating through your body, you know, through your action, your 60-40, your giving, your generosity, your kindness, your patience. That the physical presence is what is um, important. It's not your physique or your level of health. It's how the body is like your temple. The body is your temple. The body is your temple. The body is your sacred mandala. You you are at the center of your mandala, of family, friends, community. But also if you just take the body uh, in the chud practice, which is the severance practice of Tibetan Buddhist ritual of the double-sided drum and bell, and we sing and chant, and a few of us on the call know that practice, um, maybe just a couple. But the whole idea is that um, there's a certain part where we off- we do this mandala offering as a way of cultivating generosity. Now, in traditional practices, you actually take precious gems or rice or stones or grains and offer them in this beautiful kind of multi-tiered mandala and you say prayers and it's a way of enacting through through action through the body uh, generosity it's a tibetan thing but in the chud practice because the chud is a yogi practice of wandering ascetics and they don't they don't carry a lot of stuff this is uh, you know classical indian and tibetan um Um, traditions of the wandering ascetic, the sadhu, the Tibetans have a different version of that, very important tradition within Tibet. The Chud practitioners were classically wandering ascetics, um, often not staying in the same place more than a short period of time. And they would only take with them, they had a staff, which was also serving as their tent pole. It also would ward off wild dogs. (laughs) And then at, on the end of this, the pole, they would have a bag, kind of like the hobo image, right? Where 
you, they would have a mesh bag, not a closed fabric, but a mesh bag because they wanted bandits to see that they had no valuable possessions. They would have their begging bowl, their chud drum and bell, maybe a thigh bone trumpet, and um, maybe a piece of fabric for to make a tent. And so they didn't have a lot of belongings. So when it would come time to make this generosity practice of the mandala offering, it's a classic uh, preliminary practice in, in Vajrayana Buddhism, instead of offering actual substances or jewels or not really jewels, but like precious stones and rice and stuff like that, they would visualize their body as the mandala, and they would offer their body, visualize it, visualize, not literally. They would visualize offering their body, and the body, the torso is the Mount Meru, the center of the universe, the arc, the kind of cosmological center of the universe, Mount Meru. The two arms and two legs were the four cardinal directions of the mandala. You know, mandala has a center and the four cardinal directions. And the eyes are the sun and the moon. The fluids in the body, like the blood and lymph and so on, are the rivers. The organs are the islands. <laughs> You know, rivers and oceans are the fluid of the water. So they would visualize that they're offering their body as a sacred mandala as a way to cultivate generosity and release their grasping onto their physical form. And so um, I love this phrase, the body is a sacred mandala. So your body is your mandala. It's a sacred place. It's your temple. So it's through the body that we express our devotion, our love, our care, our practice. And then the speech is interesting, you know, body, speech, and mind. The speech, not just words, but also refers to our breath. And the breath connects with the subtle energy, the prana, or the lung in Tibetan, that courses through the body, through the channels, through the veins, you know. One way to describe the subtle energy is more like the motility factor, the circulatory function within the body as well. And so that has a lot of dimensions to it. Um, and But also it refers to our words. So mindfulness through our speech, through our breath, equalizing the breath, calming the breath, so that we can calm the body and the mind. And also balance the subtle body through breathing exercises, pranayama, you know, that, that is definitely an aspect of uh, Vajrayana or Tantric Buddhism. It's more like yoga in that sense. But also foundational uh, early forms of Buddhism work with the breath and that the natural breath. Eventually yogis and practitioners get to a point where they don't need to breathe. I mean, Ajahn Chah talked about this in this book that I mentioned last week, The Food for the Heart. You should definitely get this book. You got it, Diane. Great. You started it? Good. Yeah, he's very direct. I love his teaching and very essence. And he talks about how, you know, I don't know if scientists can validate this, but he says that you get to a point where you don't have to do the physical breathing anymore. The, the skin breathes. <laughs> and the Tibetans talk about this too. It ha I mean, it's happened. Great practitioners will go into samadhi in a cave or this happens in ancient India, too, probably even today. Other parts of the world where people are really doing these practices, the Taoists talk about this as well, that eventually the physical breathing doesn't need to happen anymore. I, I, you know, maybe my breath has stopped for a little longer period of time. I have had an experience where I didn't feel like I needed to breathe for a while. Um, but I, I don't have a lot of experience with that. I actually had that experience. How you want to hear about that experience a little bit? <laughs> okay, I'm not showing off at all. I'm just thought it's interesting because I, when I lived in Dharamsala, um, I taught English at a Tibetan nunnery, uh, Ani uh, Shuksep, Ani Gompa, and Nyingma and Dzogchen nunnery. And um, they had some teachers there, Kempos, who were from Bhutan, one of them in particular, the abbot of the monastery, because at that time, I hope it's changed, but n there were no women teachers. 
You'd be a nun, but you couldn't aspire or, gr- or build up to a Kempo, who's like a PhD in Buddhism. In any case, he was a very kind soul, beautiful man, actually, very supportive, very much a feminist, and it was great to get to know him and to work with him, and I would go a few days a week and teach English there in the afternoons. And when it came time for me to leave, to come back home to the United States, I was really sick. Like, I had Giardia. I had all sorts of those great things you get when you go to India, intestinal problems. And he could see that I was suffering. So he said to me as we were saying goodbye, he gave me a little pouch of medicine pills from Bhutan. And he said, these are special herbs from Bhutan. Take them when you're really feeling down. Like when you're really in a low place, take one with some hot water, chew it, swallow it. I said, thank you. And I go home, I settle in, you know, a few weeks, maybe a few months later, I real I remember, oh, I have those pills. I was, I was down, you know, I was a little culture shock, still dealing with my digestion. I was having a hard time. I'm like, oh, this feels pretty down. I'm going to take one of these pills. And I took one at night before bed. I kind of got ready for bed. I made some hot water. I ate the pill and I drank hot water with it. And then I sat down to meditate. And I entered into this space that was, I didn't have to breathe. It was like all my energy went into my central channel. Totally surprised. Like I didn't, wasn't trying to do that. I was just relaxing. It just happened. I wish that I could have called him and said, what was in that pill? <laughs> it was so great. You know, it wasn't like a hallucination. You know, it wasn't like a trip. It was very mild, maybe lasts for a half an hour. But uh, it brought about a consolidation of my prana, of my chi, in the central channel where I tasted the timeless dimension, you know. And I didn't have to breathe. Now, it felt like it was a while, but maybe it was only 10, 5, 10 minutes. I, I, don't, I don't think I was not breathing for hours. It wasn't that long, but longer than normal. And I was conscious, but I was in a different space. So I had two more of those pills. So I saved them for other low points in my life, and they did not have the same effect. <laughs> maybe they got stale. Or maybe I was wrapped up in hope. You know, maybe I wanted that again. Subtle, subtle work there. So I don't know what's going on with that, but I, but you know, you maybe have tasted little moments of that. Usually these descend on us in times when we're not expecting it. Um, in any case, that's connected to the speech, you know, all the way from the gross me talking, talking speech to the very subtle the breath, then the subtle body, and then the innermost subtle body. When they say, when the karmic winds that res- um, that circulate through more of the external channels towards the surface of the body, this is our karmic wind. You know, we have to do that. We have to rush to work. We've got to talk. We've got to work. Do all this stuff. That's like operating. What they say is in the karmic wind. The karmic wind. It's dualistic. It's you know, in samsara. But as we do practice, it, we purify and balance the flow of the prana into more of the core channels of the body, the three primary channels, the central channel and the two side channels, which are associated with day and night, sun and moon. It's yin and yang. Subject, object, dual, duality. But when, the, those duali- when those, that energy enters into the central channel, that's called the wisdom prana. The wisdom prana. And that's when we experience things like samadhi, the single pointed absorption. So we can do that through yogic exercises or simple mindfulness practice long enough. The energy balances out and the karmic winds balance into the wisdom winds. So that's a very interesting dimension under the speech category. And then the mind, in terms of this, is when you practice wholeheartedly, it shows you your thinking patterns, right? We see, it's, we look in the mirror. Oh, wow, I thought I was pretty evolved. <laughs> and I look in the mirror, 
that mind. It's good to wake up to that. It's not, it's sobering. So part of Lojong training has to do with, you know, of course, just noticing and seeing how your mind works. Getting to know yourself. How do you relate to your mind? What do you do with your mind? And then by applying mindfulness and mind training, the lojong to your mind, like a medicinal salve in a way, you can begin to reverse some of the negative habits, some of the forge new pathways, right? Kind of tread on the old habitual negative pathways less often and forge new, positive, more uplifting, more joyful, more... Um, um, you know, positive pathways. So reversing or retraining the habits of preoccupation and self-absorption that take up so much mental energy. And as a result, you've probably already started to feel this, your mind becomes less, um, less tight, right? Less boxed in. It becomes more light. It becomes more clear. It begins to relax and turn it also it's, can be more accessible outward, right? It says the 60-40, you can be inward in a good rooted way, but and not in the self-obsessed, paranoid way. You know, you be rooted, and that makes you more comfortable with the world too. So this particular slogan points out that Lojong applies to whatever we do through the body, the speech, and the mind, how we feel, what we say, how we think, and so in a way, it's a, this, these practices are ways to bring our whole system in harmony. And what's very interesting is also, you know, that I talked about the five vows last week, and I wanted to just tie the body, speech, and mind a little bit more into the virtues and non-virtues. You know, in Buddhism, we have ethical training. It's really important and often overlooked and not talked about that much in the West, especially for some reason. Um, we can think of Buddhist ethics not considered a, a right or wrong way uh, merely because the Buddha said so, but more um, what the Buddha taught is that if you want to be happy, there are certain behaviors that will help you attain that goal and others that will prevent it, right? So virtue will help you become happy. Non-virtue makes you more miserable. So in a nutshell, virtue is anything that causes happiness, and non-virtue is anything that causes suffering. And so, yes, it's abandoning certain things, but also adopting, like we talked about last week, right? We, like, we abstain from killing, we protect life. We abstain from taking what is not ours, we you know, value and respect what belongs to others, and so on. So these ten, these ten non-virtues are actually divided into body, speech, and mind. This is why I'm going in this direction. <laughs> why? What is she doing? She's going in this direction because the ten are broken into three parts according to body, speech, and mind. It's very interesting. So, you know, not killing, protecting life, not stealing, honoring what is belongs to others, no sexual misconduct, respecting the vows and the boundaries of others. That all pertains to the body, you know, ways that we cultivate virtue and abstain from non-virtue for the gateway of the body. You know, sometimes the body, speech, and mind are called the three doors. The doors of the body, speech, and mind, the way we communicate with the world and the way we let things in. So killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct are all related to the body. Um, lying, you know, telling the truth with skill. Then, you know, the speech category is interesting, has more in it than the five vows that we talked about last week. There's some nuance here. In this speech category, you've got the lying, which is also in the five vows, but you also have the divisive speech, harsh speech, and pointless gossip. So Buddhists will train in kind of abstaining from, of course, lying, but also speech that divides people, you know, that causes 
schisms in communities or in families. Also trying to abstain from harsh speech, but speaking with the kindness and care. Let compassion pervade your speech, even if you have to say something really frank or, you know, fierce. And then pointless gossip is so interesting. It's also often called meaningless chatter. <laughs> so I think we all have people like that in our life. Maybe we're one of them who li like to fill the space with chit-chat. Buddhists, if you've hung out with Buddhists a lot, you realize they're not big chit-chatters. <laughs> I mean, maybe some are. But especially monastics and people who've really trained, who are more serious about their training, they talk less, you know, just enough to connect. Have you ever been with a monastic and you're like, wow, this is really uncomfortable? I mean, when I lived in Dharamsala, I was around a lot of Tibetans. Even lay people were like this. They don't need, they didn't, I, my experience into the Tibetan refugee community was really revelatory in the sense of like, oh, we can just drink tea together. We don't have to talk all the time. Now, sometimes chit-chat can be really bonding and healing, and so even I have pointed this out, that actually studies show that a little bit of meaningless chatter can actually be really healthy. <laughs> so, you know, be kind, engage with people. Don't be too stoic. Then the mind category relates to uh, greed and covetousness, so like wanting wanting what belongs to other people, um, harmful intent, wrong view, which is really the denial of cause and effect or karma. So those are the three in the mind category, greed or covetousness, harmful intent, and wrong views. So I think that's pretty clear. So those belong to like the way we think. How do we approach the world? So these are nice little, you know, it's kind of like the Ten Commandments, <laughs> but um, the Buddhist version of it, and uh, guideposts along the way. I'll never forget the Dalai Lama gave, gave he gave uh, the Kala Chakra Empowerment in India, and he was offering the five vows for people to take, and he said you can choose which vow to take. And... Um, I was thinking, okay, which one am I going to take? Am I going to take all of them? Am I not ready to take some of them? And he gave commentary on each one, and one of them is not lying, as we talked about last week, right? And he said something interesting. He said, you know, even there's subtle forms of this category of not lying, and one of them is to not exaggerate. <laughs> I never forgot this. You know, because when we exaggerate, we're kind of inflating the truth a bit. That's a subtle form of lying, maybe not so harmful, but... And it really triggered an introspective moment for me because I realized I exaggerate. You know, I was in my early 20s. I exaggerate. Okay, why do I exaggerate? Not all the time, but sometimes. Why? Why would I exaggerate? Well, it's kind of fun. It makes the story better sometimes. But also, when I got really honest with myself, I saw that it was coming from not feeling good enough, you know? Like I didn't feel like I was enough, or my story was enough, or my experience was enough. It had to be better than what it was. Isn't that interesting? So in a way, that is a form of lying, and it's coming from a place of lack and kind of a lack of clarity, really. And a lack of feeling, okay, like I'm enough. So I took that to heart. I took that vow. And um, I try not to exaggerate. <laughs> I see it coming on, you know, like I really want to say it was longer than it was. Or <laughs> so these, these, you know, chew on these yourself and uh, keep, keep making them your own and I thought it would be nice, because I had talked about the five vows, which have a lot of overlap with these ten non-virtues and virtues, I thought it would be good to tie that in and show you how they are divided into those three groups of the body, speech, and mind. So really this combination of an ethical approach to our conduct and practical methods of taming our minds 
is built into the traditional Buddhist ethics because they reinforce each other. They reinforce each other. What we say determines how we feel and think afterwards, or what we think determines how we act with the body on the physical level and speech. And, you know, they're all reinforcing and interconnected. Okay, so we have five minutes. Any comments, questions, rebuttals, challenges? You want to do the Tibetan debate? <laughs> You could chat in a comment or question. Um, Joe said, Did, I didn't hear the vow about intoxicants, I think. Did I miss it? Right, the vow. So these aren't, what I listed tonight aren't vows. They're just the 10 non-virtues to avoid. And um, last week, we did do the five vows, right? We talked about them. I didn't give them. I'm not qualified to like give you the vows. But a lama or you know venerable teacher will do that. But they are, one of them is, uh, you know, not getting intoxicated. It's interesting that this isn't in here. Yeah, I don't know why. Um, yeah. So some someone thought, we need to put that vow in <laughs> the five vows. But the intoxicants, of course, is like, don't become so intoxicated that you lose your sense of judgment. Right? Doesn't mean you can't enjoy a little something every once in a while. Um, so I took that vow. It took me a while to come around to that one. <laughs> I think that was the last one I took. <laughs> yeah, yeah, those fancy herb pills. Too bad. Can't market that one. I, I have a feeling that maybe subtle or certain forms of herbal alchemy, you know, was used in all of these cultures. Maybe they don't talk about it so explicitly. But um, it's, a, it's an important area of study, actually. Psychopharmacology. Heidi, thank you. Good reminders about practicing our Buddhist human values. Yes, yeah, basic. Ba it's always nice to come back to the basics. I don't know about you, but I always feel really, I like it. It makes me feel grounded and like, yeah, I feel good. Feel good thinking about these things. Ted has a link. What is the link, Ted? Um, I like the one Claudia says about the intoxicants in that it says that you can lose your judgment and then hurt others. Exactly. Right. That's the main thing. You can hurt others and hurt yourself if you get too out there. Right. You can drunk driving. Right. One example. Yeah. Oh, so Ted shared a link on the efficacy of precious uh, Tibetan pills, I think you meant to say, right? Not oils. Yeah, there's all sorts of wonderful uh, different herbal remedies um, and pills. Longevity pills, also for all sorts of ailments. They have their whole medicinal system, medical system, that's rooted in Indian and Chinese medicine. It's a, a, Tibetan medicine is an amazing... Um, combination of those two and a dear friend of mine is actually teaching a workshop on Tibetan medicine if people are interested you should go to taramandala.org and it's called the Soa Rigpa tradition of Tibetan medicine his name is Eric Jampa Anderson he's a wonderful, brilliant um, uh, doctor so there's an online program coming up any day now about Tibetan medicine well, oh, thank you. Yeah, any, we have one minute here. Anyone else? Are you going to keep the three inseparable? Yeah. Okay, everyone. Well, I think Eve will be with you next week. Um, 
I mean, she might be with you for the next two weeks. I have to do a, have a procedure done. Not a big deal. Don't worry about me. I'm fine. Don't email me asking if I'm okay. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> uh, but I might be out for the rest of the month. I'm not saying you guys did it. It happened to me in my last class. I got all these emails. <laughs> um, but I might be gone for a couple of weeks and, and then back when I can. Okay, everyone, I see another couple new messages. Yeah, thank you, for, uh, Noam and Mace, for pasting Donna. Please give. The Sangha, the, the, the SFDC, really values anything you can give. Yeah, there's some good Tibetan doctor references coming in here. Check it out. Okay, thanks, everyone. Take care. Be well. Remember, the abyss is bliss. Sixty forty. I'm making up my own slogans. <laughs> we should do like a, I've always said this. We should could do a collected like a open source slogan. Uh, I don't know if Google Form or something like that. Be fun. Okay, I'm gonna go. Take care.